So today we're going to be talking about a couple of different viral infections in the immune response and how you model them. Again, we'll go through relatively quickly, but there's plenty of time today for additional sessions or uh, discussions in the Slack about anything you want more details on. Um, and the first infection we're going to talk about, and then in your exercises, you're going to do some models around is hepatitis C, which is an enveloped positive strand RNA virus, and uh, it's a flavivirus. Uh, it was first isolated in 89, and the first treatments emerged in the early 90s. And in particular, what we're going to be talking about today are treatments, um, this, this sort of first phase of treatments and how uh, their mechanisms of action were determined for modeling. Um, there's still a large number of infections worldwide that that's starting to change, uh, and it's an incredibly productive virus. So 10 to the 12 viral particles produced per day uh, with a relatively short half-life, um, various genotypes with three dominant in the US. Um, and it has this interesting replication. It's the only virus I know that's described to replicate this way via negative stranded RNA and a membranous web in the cytoplasm. And so um, like coronavirus, which I'm gonna mention at the end of the talk, it's uh, translated as um, a, a large polypeptide because it's a single stranded positive strand RNA virus. And so each of these proteins comes out a, as a, you know, on a single chain that then has to be cleaved. Um, and it makes its own autoprotease to, uh, to facilitate that cleavage. And it has a number of structural proteins like most viruses, an envelope protein, a capsid protein, and then a, lot, a number of non-structural proteins, including its um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase um, and um, various innate immune uh, managers. And <laughs> um, we'll talk about those briefly. Uh, but its uh, life cycle is like most enveloped viruses. It gets uh, endocytosed uh, via a specific set of receptors, uh, uncoats after being uh, endocytosed in an endosome. Um, and then unlike uh, flu, which we're going to talk about, it stays in the cytoplasm for its entire life cycle. It forms this, as, as I mentioned, uh, odd sort of uh, organellar structure called a membranous web where it, it scaffolds all of its proteins, um, makes its replication uh, hub, and then um, makes new proteins and new genomes uh, that then get repackaged and exocytosed. So this general principle for most viruses is, is true with you know, interesting differences in terms of how they uh, specifically replicate. So the problem with hepatitis C is that its preferred cell type for replication is the liver epithelial cell. Um, and so um, what you have are cycles of um, damage from viral replication of those cells, uh, which causes those cells to then uh, try to proliferate to, to replace themselves, to grow new liver. Um, and you get this cycle of necrosis and proliferation because the virus is not cleared. Um, this is not a chronic virus in the sense of HIV where it embeds in the genome. It just is able to survive perpetually by replicating at a very high level and, um, and not being fully cleared by the immune response uh, in individuals in which it's chronic. Um, and so as this, these cycles of proliferation and necrosis occur, um, you start getting uh, scarring uh, where the uh, replication doesn't fill in uh, appropriately and form a nice epithelial layer. Um, you start getting um, strange structures forming from that, probably through uh, interactions with the extracellular matrix. Um, and then this eventually leads towards uh, tumorigenesis. So large cycles of stromal cell replication are generally uh, not good. Uh, you can accumulate genetic instability. Um, and then this is uh, what's going to drive liver cancer. And so if we think back to yesterday and the mechanisms of um, immune responses that we would want to use to get rid of this virus, um, we're talking about viruses up here. Um, <laughs> hepatitis isn't on this chart, but we can compare it to some of the other viruses that are on here. And you can see that uh, because it's intracellular, we're going to want to use CD8 T cells to kill. And then potentially we could use neural immunity. And we're going to talk about um, actual clinical studies that have looked at the relative role of each of these arms of, of the immune system and how effective they are. Um, so the first response to any virus is going to be the innate immune response. And so innate uh, antiviral effectors, such as the type 1 interferon response that act on the host epithelial cell that regulate key components of cell biology to limit viral growth and spread. In principle, antibodies should be able to remove this virus as it spreads from cell to cell. 
Um, but in practice, the correlation of antibody with HCV clearance and outcome is either controversial or actually completely lacking. And so there are patients with high levels of what we call neutralizing antibodies that maintain chronic infection. And so that indicates that these neutralizing antibodies are not sterilizing. And so I want to take a minute just to explain what I mean by the use of these words, because you hear them a lot again in the news these days because of all of the COVID um, work. So neutralization is usually a functional assay that occurs in vitro where people use antibodies from infected individuals or from vaccinated individuals in an assay where they try to block viral entry into you know, a cell line, a susceptible cell line. And um, so this is a functional assay that's meant to replicate what's happening in vivo in terms of how antibodies would work against a virus. But we don't actually know how well it correlates um, for any particular infection. Um, and even for well-studied infections like influenza, there are, there are clear discordances between what we measure in vitro and what happens in vivo. And so any neutralization assay, I think you need to take with a grain of salt. It's a functional assay, which is good, um, but it's still incredibly artificial in that it's in vitro in a, in a model cell line. When we talk about sterilization, what we mean is that the presence of this antibody will block subsequent infection. Uh, and so if you have high levels of neutralizing antibody, but you're propagating chronic infection, then you know these neutralizing antibodies are not acting in a, a sterilizing manner or in vivo. Um, if you have high levels of neutralizing antibodies after a vaccination, in principle, you should prevent infection entirely, and that would be called sterilizing protection. And so then the last arm of, of the effector response would be cell-mediated clearance. So infected cells here can be killed before releasing progeny virons, and this is really thought to be the primary means of long-term control in HCV infection. So we're gonna go through these um, uh, briefly. So the um, antiviral response that's mounted as an innate response is the classic type one interferon response that you're gonna associate with most viruses, especially RNA viruses. So these interferon-induced genes interfere with viral replication directly. So they reduce protein synthesis by inhibiting initiation factors and in protein translation. And then they target viral RNA with various um, RNases and RNA modifying enzymes. And so this is a common theme of targeting RNA viruses, which are, which are plentiful and which are a constant source of trouble for uh, mammals generally, um, is that you have a large number of these enzymes that actually attack various aberrant forms of nuclear and cytoplasmic RNA. So things like OAS and RNASL. And then innate responses can enhance or initiate, or initiate adaptive responses so innate response is typically uh, the type 1 interferon response upregulates MHC class 1 expression. And so that's going to reveal to T cells what's happening inside the cell. You're going to put more and more levels of MHC1 on the cell surface. Um, and then they're going to secrete chemokines to pull those adaptive immune cells to the site of inflammation and infection and, and that trafficking of adaptive cells to the site of inflammation and infection. And one way that we often measure uh, these responses, and this is just an example of that, and, and you're going to get a lot of these data if you end up modeling the immune response, um, is RNA levels of these various type 1 interferon response genes. This happens to be from a microarray from a, a, a non-human primate that was infected with hepatitis C, which is one of the only models that works for hepatitis C. Um, now we use RNA-seq more than you see microarrays, but it's the same principle where you get red means upregulated of all of these different type 1 interferon response genes. So all the IRFs, which are the transcription factors that regulate type 1 interferon response genes, the actual response genes themselves, uh, MHC class one, which I mentioned over here um, as well. Um, hepatitis C has a large number of, um, of restriction factors to try to block innate immune recognition. Um, and so in almost any RNA virus replication cycle, you're gonna have a, a stage of the RNA virus replication where you form double-stranded RNA. And double-stranded RNA almost never occurs in a normal mammalian eukaryotic cell unless it's infected with the virus. So this is a, this, any form of double-stranded RNA is almost always a danger signal or a pattern that can be recognized by the innate immune response. And that's the main thing that's recognized by the rig like receptor family. rig was actually, was actually discovered in the context of hepatitis C infection. So the founding member of this pattern recognition family, hepatitis C was the infection that led us to discover it. Um, and hepatitis C makes this non-structural protein that actually cleaves off a key scaffolding molecule that's necessary for rig eye to activate the IRF signaling path pathway and activate type one interferon uh, secretion. So rig eye binds to this protein called IPS1, on, which is on the surface of the mitochondria, and that's where it starts initiating its signaling cascade where it can activate IRF3. 
forgot here is bound to the double-stranded RNA structure that forms from, um, from HCV replication. And this NS34A uh, protein from hepatitis C just cleaves it straight off the, uh, the mitochondria. There are also um, other activities of um, hepatitis uh, C non-structural and structural proteins that are thought to inhibit innate immune signaling or direct innate immune effectors. So OAS is one of those RNA modifying enzymes. PKR is um, another double-stranded RNA detector and hepatitis C makes proteins that can block both of these. And this is reviewed nicely here by Michael Gale, who is the guy that discovered Rigai in the context of hepatitis C infection. Okay, so you have this mounting innate immune response, and a key uh, feature of those uh, innate immune responses are gonna be the secretion of chemokines and cytokines. And so chemokines are the attractants of innate and adaptive immune cells to the site of inflammation. And the nomenclature of chemokines is, um, is, was tried to be simplified, but it created another you know, nomenclature that has just a bunch of letters and numbers. So you know you're talking about a chemokine if you see a CC or a CXC. These are two different families of chemokines. And then there's a large number of numbers after them. Um, and these will be secreted by the infected hepatocytes. Um, and each one of these will recruit a different uh, profile of innate, so monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, um, dendritic cells and um, and adaptive. So this is uh, CD4, Th1 cells and CD8, CTLs, cytotoxic lymphocytes, to the site of inflammation. Um, and so, uh, but the particular type of innate response you make will bias the key innate and adaptive immune cell types towards whether or not we make that critical type one response, which is gonna secrete interferon gamma, again, the signature cytokine of type one, Th1 immune responses, that are gonna promote CD8 T cells to kill infected cells. So this is, the, this is the response we want because we wanna kill infected cells. And as I've already previewed for you, antibodies, which would be more maybe of a Th2 type response, are not going to work uh, particularly well in this infection. And this is probably the best studied human infection for showing that CD8 T cells have, a, um, have an important role in, um, in uh, clearing infection. Um, and so this is uh, a really nice review from um, a group uh, from Charlie Rice um, that put a lot of effort into defining the protective mechanisms in people that naturally control hepatitis C infection. Um, and so uh, this is an example of a patient uh, that controls hepatitis C infection spontaneously, which was not at all uncommon. Um, and uh, and we're, I'm just going to take you through this, and then I'm going to show you an example of a patient that fails to control and requires treatment. Um, so this is the HCV RNA uh, pattern in this patient. So it goes up. Um, and the um, um, spikes around a little bit, so that's in yellow, and then comes down and is undetectable by six months. ALT is a, um, a liver enzyme, so it's a measure of liver damage, and the same thing, it goes up with the HCV RNA as the liver is getting damaged, comes back down, bounces around, and then returns to normal levels uh, as the virus disappears. Um, here what we're looking at is the number of epitopes, so the number of peptide MHC targets targeted by either the CD4 or the CD8 response as a function of time. So they go up and then they stay up. So the number of different targets of the T cell response um, is maintained at a high level over the entire course of the infection. This is the number of targets, not necessarily the number of cells over this time course. Um, here, this is actually the number of cells and it's broken up by the target a protein in hepatitis C that is, um, that is the target of, of the particular cell response. So you have um, large numbers of cells at three and six months when you have a large amount of viral antigen, um, and then it starts contracting, which is the normal uh, contraction of the immune response as you clear the antigen. But you're still maintaining a diverse repertoire, so you're targeting multiple features of the virus um, over this entire period, and you have a nice memory response here to keep the virus suppressed. Um, if you re-encounter it or if there's any residual virus at this stage. If you look at the uh, antibody response, this is the neutralizing antibody response in purple. So it goes up, but you see it doesn't really match the dynamics of either the T cell response or the viral, um, um, the viral RNA. And the total antibody response is much higher than the neutralizing antibody response and stays elevated through this entire period. Just seems relatively uncorrelated to the viral dynamics um, altogether. Um, and then this is a really key figure. This is the, the number of mutations that occur in the virus over this time period. This is months here. 
And so at, the, at five months, one mutation has occurred in NS5B, which is one of the proteins that was targeted by the T-cell response. And presumably this mutation was an escape mutation where the virus mutated this part of the virus so that it could no longer be targeted by this T-cell response. But because you had so many other targets of the T-cell response, the virus was still able to control, be able to control by your CD4 and CD8 T-cell response. So that's what a good response looks like. This person spontaneously cleared an infection and no longer needed treatment. Okay, this is a bad, um, this is a, uh, a bad response and a, pa a patient that would go on to needing treatment and had chronic infection. So here's their RNA level. Um, so they were unable to, to initially control the virus. It stayed at high levels and it never comes under control. The liver damage um, eventually subsides but starts spiking up again. And if this patient went on to live without treatment for many years, eventually ALT would rise and they would go into liver failure. Uh, if we look at the number of epitopes targeted by the CD4 and CD8 response, it's very different than in the protected patient. It goes up, uh, but then comes down. Eventually, there are no targets of the CD4 response, and we'll see why. Um, in the CD8 response, the number of targets declines with time and is not ever at a very particularly high level. The magnitude of the CD8 response goes way up at three months, probably to similar levels as in the protected patient, um, but then comes crashing down despite these high levels of antigen and persistent virus. And you can see a large part of the T cell response, probably the CD8 response, is targeting this NS3 protein. And so the response is really jackpotted against a single protein. And if we look down here, just skipping ahead to the sequence changes that occur, you see this mutation appear at three months in the NS3 protein that corresponds with the loss of that response and the loss of really control of the virus. And so you accumulate a large number of mutations here targeting each of the proteins that are being targeted by the CD8 and CD4 T cell response which means the virus has just completely escaped the cellular response. It's made mutations that either block recognition by those particular T cells, or maybe even block that peptide binding to MHC altogether, which is a very common way for viruses try to, to escape a very specific uh, peptide MHC response. If we look at the antibody response though, we have very high levels of both neutralizing and total antibodies, persistent levels, matching the levels of antigen, but these are clearly doing nothing to control the, the virus. And so antibodies here are, are ineffective in long-term control. <clears throat> okay, so um, one interesting observation that came along with uh, understanding that the, t the cellular response was really critical to long-term control was that um, uh, have the number of upregulated genes shown here in gray, in these gray bars, um, uh, the number of upregulated type 1 interferon induced genes was correlated with long term viral control. And so, viral control here <laughs> um, is, in, uh, is sort of represented in black by the, um, the um, uh, sorry, uh, the black bars are uh, the, um, the viral RNA, so high viral RNA here, um, <laughs> the, in here and low viral RNA here and here. Um, and then in the, um, in the gray and the triangles are the number of um, interferon regulated genes that are upregulated. And so there was this negative correlation between um, viral RNA and the uh, number of upregulated type 1 interferon genes. And this gets back to this idea that the setup of the innate response driving towards this type 1 response was going to promote a really robust and healthy cellular response that was going to clear and control the infection. And so it's the interplay of the innate and the adaptive response that was really critical here. Okay, so uh, because of these observations, one of the very early treatments in the very early 90s that was tried for um, HCV was uh, to just give patients more type 1 interferon. So it was the first therapy introduced. Um, the full mechanism of action was really unclear. It was just sort of an empirical idea that, well, uh, patients that make more type 1 interferon do better. Let's just give patients that make less type 1 interferon more type 1 interferon. Um, and so the idea was that it must enhance just the normal response pathways. There were correlations with the genotype of the virus, um, starting out with low baseline levels of HCV RNA, um, and the stage of infection in which you got treatment that were the strongest correlates of the efficacy. Again, trying to maybe mimic someone that mounted a really strong early response. Um, and um, the idea that maybe giving a very strong dose early could overcome some of the negative regulatory feedback loops, Tregs in particular, that drive, uh, that, uh, that drive a switch in the type of response in the infected host. Um, but um, the specific mechanism was not really demonstrated biologically. And this is one of the things that um, you can model um, and that uh, the uh, 
afternoon activities are going to have um, examples of, um, because there were very precise measurements of viral RNA uh, during uh, interferon therapy treatments. And so you saw this very rapid decline. This is a log scale of HCV uh, viral RNA in the first phase of antiviral treatment with interferon. And then this um, lower slope um, of, of clearance in this, what was called the second phase. And so these, this difference between the two slopes was thought to represent two different mechanisms of antiviral efficacy, um, this sort of direct killing of viral production, and then the slow turnover of infected, infected hepatocytes as they were eventually cleared by the cellular response. Um, and then another drug was introduced, and that drug was um, uh, ribavirin. So interferon alone only induced a yield of uh, 20 to 25% response um, following a 12 to 18 month course. And this is, a, you know, it's a, it's a rough drug because you're, uh, you're basically getting all of those symptoms of being on uh, high levels of cytokines, so fever and chills and, um, and aches uh, that interferon in induces. Um, and then they added this drug, ribavirin, uh, which um, is a broad-based antiviral. It's a, it's a nucleoside analog, so it's, it's interrupting. Um, it, it was designed to look like a nucleotide so that it would interrupt um, viral replication, but it wasn't really known how it would work. Um, and this raised uh, the efficacy rate up to 40% in individuals um, to have this sustained viral response, which is what's... Um, which is what we're looking for in HCV. That's the term of success. Um, and it was varied by genotype. And so this just shows um, influenza plus ribavirin versus influenza plus placebo and, and the greater response rate. You can still, still see here, it's not fantastic. Less than half the people are still responding. Um, so as I mentioned, it was, ribavirin was initially designed as a nucleoside analog and developed as an anti-influenza drug in the 60s, but it really didn't work particularly well against influenza, and so it was dropped, um, but was brought out again against HCV because of the lack of specific antivirals at that time. Um, it's been used, it was used against Ebola, um, and it's used commonly still against RSV in immunosuppressed patients um, and uh, in uh, some high-risk uh, influenza groups. And so there were five mechanisms of action that were proposed for ribavirin. So um, a couple of them were related to its, its role as a nucleoside analog, so looking like a nucleotide that would interrupt viral replication and the, the, uh, the production of new genomes. Um, and so this included uh, direct binding to the um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and hepatitis C. Um, it included um, interrupting the synthesis of um, nucleotides within the cell. So this is a key enzyme in the, in the process of nucleotide synthesis. But then there were these other ideas that it had immunomodulatory processes, uh, properties um, that it induced lethal mutagenesis in the virus by incorporating directly into the genome, and that it actually modulated interferon-stimulated gene expression. So this is just a summary of of all of those potential sites of mechanism of action. So it could act um, uh, directly on um, the RNA-dependent uh, polymerase. It could act um, here. It could act on the synthesis of guanosine, the G and ACTG, um, which this IMPDH enzyme is required to, uh, for synthesis. So it was thought to maybe bind that enzyme was thought to potentially get incorporated into the HCV RNA, but cause errors in the HCV genome so that you made new viruses, but they weren't effective. <laughs> um, and then it was thought that maybe it worked through this immunomodulation, that somehow it was actually changing how cells differentiated between Th1 and Th2 uh, responses. And all of these were based on in vitro studies um, of the drug directly and were being limited by the fact that we just really didn't have great in vitro um, culture systems for HCV um, and still don't actually have really robust in vitro culture systems for HCV. And so the question was, well, what data would help resolve this, this mechanism of, of ribavirin? And so um, <laughs> there were, um, uh, each of these is, is listed as a hypothesis and then what data would potentially validate that hypothesis. So if it was immunomodulatory in the way that it had been measured in, in vitro, it was thought that it should act independently of interferon. Um, if it was inhibiting guanosine synthesis by targeting this enzyme IMPDH, it was thought it would reduce uh, viral production that could be overcome by adding new guanosine. Um, if it was directly inhibiting the polymerase, it should reduce viral production. Um, and you should see uh, mutations in the virus uh, and 
uh, to try to get around uh, the binding of this drug to the viral polymerase. If it was inducing lethal mutagenesis, you should actually keep viral production, but um, and actually keep the same number of infected cells, uh, but and, but produce new infected cells at a lower rate because those new viruses are defective. And if it should alter interferon simulated gene expression, then it maybe should have direct antiviral effects like interferon and shift IHD expression from uh, the negative feedback and regulatory pathways um, that are uh, seen in HCV. So, um, so people worked to develop these biological in vitro experiments, um, but they were limited by the fact that um, uh, the in vitro systems for HCV are, are really poor um, and don't replicate the in vivo situation well at all. Um, they generated um, alternative drugs that were less toxic than ribavirin that performed a single ribavirin function, and they found that they did not recapitulate ribavirin efficiency. Um, su suggesting that maybe multiple pathways might be acting together. Um, and so this is a good example where biological mechanisms can often seem plausible, but can be difficult to pr prove conclusively that they play an important role, um, particularly when, in this case, this drug was reverse engineered to the pathogen, right? So we had this drug sitting on the shelf, they tried it, it worked, uh, but they, you know, it wasn't designed for a particular uh, target, so it was difficult to tease apart how it worked. And so uh, in the exercises today, you're gonna see how mathematical modeling from real infection data provides a compelling argument for the viral life cycle stages that might be affected. And, and so I'm not gonna give away the answer because you're gonna see it in the exercises, um, but you're gonna see how we can use mathematical modeling to, to distinguish between um, the relative contribution of, of each of these pathways. Um, I wanna finish HCV just by mentioning that there's um, other drugs now available for HCV. And uh, these are, are designed specifically to target specific non-structural proteins in um, HCV. Um, so, <coughs> um, so Fuspavir, which I have always have a hard time uh, um, uh, saying, is uh, potentially um, the one that you might have heard the most about. Again, targeting uh, these parts of the replication complex um, and have been found to be um, incredibly um, potent. So this is the number of patients um, that are um, a percentage of patients that are successfully uh, treated with these new drug um, uh, uh, combinations in comparison to the old um, uh, interferon, ribavirin, um, uh, even in the, with the inclusion of, of another direct antiviral that had improved uh, interferon and ribavirin up to about 80%. Um, um, so these drugs uh, now uh, effectively clear HCV entirely even from um, uh, chronic infections. And really, it's, it's I think, one of the greatest um, accomplishments of modern medicine to go from the discovery of a virus in 1989 to its targeted elimination by um, you know, 2014 is um, really uh, quite impressive.